uh, Dr. Tyson, it's an honor and a privilege, sir. Thank oh, no, you so please much. Please call me Neil as okay. well. All yeah. right. Um, before I, love I start, your background there, very. Thank very you. Well, you know, I've I've read the book. Oh, so if you put the book, to, oh, ah, went, that's ah. the old. It's an older book, but I love the term spaghettification. Oh, good, good, so good. That's lovely. Um, very I good. wasn't sure. And what's the how bottle much, of wine? What's that? And what's well, the... my family, my extended family, the last name was Sublet. Um, they have a, a winery in Bordeaux that my I aspired to get out there one day. Uh -huh. I had not been there, but uh, I learned about my family history about 15 years ago. We were the descendants of French Huguenots. Oh, I guess. Uh, okay. Yes, yes. Uh, so I wasn't and, sure. And what, what, and what bottle of wine is it? Uh, I don't even remember. It's just a it's just a pretty bottle. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's just a pretty okay. bottle. Uh, I wasn't sure what Jody told you. I'm a meteorologist by training, operational meteorologist. I worked 20 years doing TV weather. Uh, then I got out of that line of work six years. I worked in Princeton, Jersey, uh, for Climate Central, a climate science communications organization. And uh, now I've come back to my hometown in Richmond to do some forecasting, some environmental uh, reporting. We do a small weather, national weather podcast. Um, so this is all kind of to support that. And uh, my wife and I are going to be coming to the gig next week when you're in town. So we're Thank very you. much looking forward to that forward to that yeah. mm -hmm. um before we get into the official stuff your heart out is quarter after the hour uh so oh no 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 so let me just check here because i guess i got something that got moved so hold on a sec there might be a little more breathing room uh i'm good to the half hour so okay. we got a whole half hour here all right well thank you if that thank will you. work for you mm -hmm. very much all right okay. before we get into all the officialness i i just want to say as somebody also tries to communicate science uh, endeavors to do that i just want to say personally thank you for what you do okay uh, thank you for being my personal astrophysicist ah. thank you for sitting down with colbert and rogan thanks for doing star talk thanks for writing the books thanks for doing the cosmos reboot uh, as someone who tries to communicate science i not only just so i learn about science but i learn ways to communicate to people who who kind of need to be communicated to uh so for that i want to personally uh Thank you. And I can be your personal meteorologist if, if you ever so need. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, All right. Well, so thank which, you for those for the uh those warm comments. The the uh it's not often that people recognize that even if they know the content of what I speak, that there may be methods, tools, tactics that they can absorb. And thank you for noticing that because I think of that when I wonder, are my colleagues reading this? And if they are, how might they benefit from it? So you, you're actually speaking directly with what I had in mind half the Wonderful. time when I'm writing. So thank you. Thank, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and that's what I kind of wanted to to talk about. You, you do so much of this outreach and it's extraordinary. So I want to talk about the importance of that outreach, um, specifically, you know, the importance of scientific literacy and scientific communication in an era of disinformation. I mean, you work tirelessly to get the solid scientific information out there. There's so much bad information, whether it's disinformation or misinformation, you know, the change in Twitter slash X and Facebook, they're always changing algorithms. So my first question to you, you know, thinking about cosmic perspectives as we do, uh, how concerned are you about scientific literacy, both domestically and internationally? And what can any or all of us do to strengthen it? Yeah, I mean, in a free country, science illiteracy is, I mean, anyone has the right to be illiterate, scientifically illiterate. There's, no one's going to chase after you and, you know, pin you down to a table and force feed you science. Of course, uh, in every state, you're required to go to school through some age, uh, but it's not clear how much science is required in the minimum educational portfolio of each state but you know most people do graduate high school okay so we can ask the question what's going on in the science classroom in the high school is it what it needs to be to preempt what we see rampant across society and apparently it's not enough or it's not the right the right ingredients and so I've thought quite a bit about this. I mean, consider, you know, there's this song by Alice Cooper. I don't know the title of the song. Maybe it's just called Schools Out. Mm, uh, yeah. And oh, yeah. the line goes, schools out, 
for the summer. School's out forever. All right, this is a very, uh, uh, it's an it's anthemic, right? It's like school is done and I'm done with school and I'm going to celebrate that with a rock song. And so we, no one seems to be asking what's going on in school so that you would celebrate not having to go to school when your only job is to learn. That's an, that's an odd state we find ourselves in. And I don't want to blame the student. All right. We've all toiled through classes, but if your only job is to learn, maybe that can be made joyous. Maybe the curiosity necessary to learn to learn on your own is what school needs to impart in all of its students so that when you get out of school you say i'm sad school is over but i now will continue to learn on my own because i've been inculcated with a that's not a good word i've been <laughs> infused with with a, a a curiosity about all that i still have yet to learn Okay, so that's, that's a foundational comment about the school system. More specifically about science, we're taught science in these fat books with words that are bold-faced that you're supposed to memorize for the exam, and then you move on. And I don't remember science being taught as a means of querying nature. Science is a is a tool to probe what you do not yet know. And the scientific method, which whoever can remember how to recite it, the recitation and the words used are not very informative. Uh, test hypothesis, it's very, no, no. That's not what the scientific method is. I will tell you what the scientific method is. It is do whatever it takes to not Fool yourself into thinking something is true that is not, or that something is not true that is. That's what the scientific method is. Top to bottom, left to right, front to back. And if it means we can't trust our senses, bring out a chart recorder or bring out some other methods. If it means you're biased, Get someone else to check your bias if you have a hidden bias within you that you don't even see yourself. What are some of the... Oh, and if you're susceptible to thinking something is true just because it feels good, get someone else who for whom their feelings are not invested in it being true and get their view on it and compare it with yours. These are ways to for the checks and balances of what it is you declare to be true. What I have found is a lot of the misinformation is peddled, shall I use that word, by charismatic people who will tell you on a YouTube channel or whatever is their platform, I'm telling you the truth, but the big establishment wants to suppress it because they don't want you to know it. Apparently, that's irresistible. It's irresistible for truth telling it's irresistible for product marketing all right i have this new device that will bypass all of the decades of marketing that's gone on with big pharma big business big government and i'm your advocate oh my gosh we're we're all in when someone appeals in that way advertisers know this because they know that you will respond more readily to a testimony of another human being than you will to a bar chart or a pie chart, which might encapsulate all the information you need to know about the integrity of the product, but that's insufficient. Get one person saying, this was the best thing I'd ever seen. Is it? Wow, I want that. So there's a missing dimension to our educational training. Much of it is rooted in our knowledge, understanding, and awareness of probability and statistics. Can you read the, the weight loss data and find out that 90% of the people do not have the result of the person who's testifying? Did you read that? 
Did you look at that? If you want to know where you're likely to fall in the data, go take a look. No, it might, you don't want to fall there. You want to be with the successful person. So our inability to think statistically confounds our ability to think sensibly and rationally about data. And without understanding what the scientific method is, especially with regard to our bias, implicit or explicit bias, known or unknown bias, um, it leaves adults susceptible for all the behavior we see on the internet and especially in social media. So I'm, I'm taking the hard slash easy answer to you and saying it's the educational system that if it were properly wired would preempt so much of what we see in conduct as in, in, in adulthood. That's a very long answer to your question, but you asked a very loaded question there. Well, there, there's a lot going on there. I'm, I'm absolutely of the same mind that there is a lot of money to be made in a capitalistic society and selling something, uh, selling information that people already want to believe. So I'm absolutely of the same mind there. And we see that uh, all the time. I want to add one other thing I meant to include. So there's the charismatic person who's telling you they have the answer and others don't. There's also the lone expert, okay? The person, and we saw this during COVID, there's some MDs who were just anti-vax, right? That is not mainstream medicine. This is fringe medicine talking. And so they'll have their pedigree on the screen. MD, Stanford, Harvard, whatever these these name impressive places. And then you're going to say, well, that's what I want to think is true anyway. It resonates with where I'm coming from. So I'm going to go with them and I'm going to tell people I'm listening to an expert. What people are not realizing is that scientific objective truths are not established by lone wolves. They're established by repeated measurements, observations of a declared result. And only when the repeated measurements verify it, is that result anything that can be brought into the world of objective truths. Until that happens, it is fringe, it is, it is, and, and for some reason, forces were operating to get the public to think that mainstream equals bad for some reason, when mainstream is exactly what progresses science. It is precisely how it works, where, and mainstream is not, oh, let's just all agree and be stubborn about it. No, mainstream is, these are experiments that repeatedly give us approximately or precisely the same result. We're going with it and we're moving on to the next problem where you will see us fight about what's true and what's not on the frontier. Uh, but until then, no. And by the way, the researchers are faceless entities. The, the people who verify their research, you don't know who they are. They don't have YouTube channels. And so there's this charismatic person speaking on their own YouTube channel. And there's this vaguely rooted result you hear it sounds vague well some research has found that this is what's actually going on here's what you should do no i'm listening to this person and so that's just to round out what it is you we were trying to get across there no i i tell people that in in meteorology before the before the computers got so good in these last 20 years uh, the um the, the best forecast is a consensus forecast. You take 10 meteorologists, they look at the data, you take the average of all they say, over time, that's going to be the forecast that ends up correct. There will always be this occasional outlier for sure. But in the longer term, that's where that's where the money is is to be made. Right, right. Think... And, and by the way, the word consensus, I think officially means opinion. Uh, and so that consensus of opinion is actually redundant. But when we use the word consensus for science, these aren't opinions being expressed. These are the results of scientific experiments that are being reported by scientists. It's not simply their opinion that, no, it may come across that way. We, you say, well, what's the best medical opinion, right? Opinions are, get a second opinion, all right? Usually when you ask for a second opinion, it's because you didn't like the first answer and you're going to keep doctor hopping until you find an answer you like and then you're going to say that's the diagnosis which is itself a confirmation bias 
uh, which is the most pernicious among the biases. So, so I wish we had a different word, but we have to use it. Scientific consensus is the alignment of research outcomes, not the alignment of whimsical opinions held by scientists themselves. Well, talk about word usage for a minute, because we know there are certain words that we use in the scientific community that have very different connotations in the general public. The first one that comes to mind is theory. You know, when we say a scientific theory, that's pretty close to being a fact as opposed to some kind of wishy-washy thing that a lot of um, the general public sees. That's that's kind of hypothesis. That's we're nowhere near that yet. Are are there some words that that you've kind of run up against and you've kind of just decided to avoid in communication? Oh, yeah. oh tons. Oh yeah. So I mean, if you're going to communicate, if you're going to call yourself an educator slash communicator, then you've got to sift through your entire lexicon, see what works, see what doesn't, see what. Uh, now, my I am fortunate. I'm, I'm my expertise is in a field where our lexicon is highly transparent so that I spend much less time defining words for someone than is, than would normally occur with other professions. Jupiter has a big red spot on its atmosphere. We call it Jupiter's red spot, right? The sun has spots. They're officially called sun spots, right? So I don't have to then define what a sun spot is. I can just use the term and keep talking about them. Uh, so just make that clear with regard to theory. Um, what I've done is uh, because it's very hard to change the public's understanding of a word. Uh, if that word has usage outside of your field that will persist no matter how you define it for them. So theory is one of those words. So someone at home will say, you know, I have a theory that my car, uh, you know, th there's, so that's how they're using the word theory. You can't knock on every door and tell people to use the word differently. <laughs> so I use the word theory only for established theories that are already in place. Einstein's general theory of relativity, special theory of relativity, um, evolutionary theory, this sort of thing. And when people say, oh, well, if it's just a theory, that's of course the buzz phrase, I say, um, no, a theory is the highest level of understanding we have of the universe. It is not the lowest level. The lowest level would be a hypothesis. So if someone says, well, if I have a theory that, no, I say, Einstein had a theory, you have a hypothesis, <laughs> awaiting testing. And then that's, people uh, chuckle at that. And then we, so no one is then uh, distracted by it. And so... Uh, yeah, so the word hypothesis is very helpful in this regard. Just tell people they have a hypothesis. If it's not yet tested, it's a hypothesis. If it's tested and it organizes ideas and it gives us insights into future discoveries, it is elevated to the level of theory. So they need. So I will say that if the conversation goes there. But if I'm just a few sentences and sound bites on the evening news, I will not use the term at all understand and by the, by the way nor will i use the word fact a fact is that that word is is fraught it's fraught because it is a fact that if i remember the quotes correctly it's a fact that president trump said you could use bleach to 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 cure covid or whoever it, said, it is a fact that they said it that doesn't mean it works so there's plenty of facts out there that reference things that are not true so like i said the word fact is fraught it is a fact that andrew wakefield published a paper declaring a connection between mmr virus uh, vaccine and the, the um, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, and autism. It is a fact that he published a paper exploring that connection. That doesn't mean that's a connection. So it is a fact that mothers reported that after their kids were vaccinated, they got 
um, they uh, showed symptoms of autism. Okay, uh, that doesn't make it a car a, a cause and effect correlation. So I don't. I never use the word fact ever. It's a, I, it's the word does not work. To, to and, that point, I, are there other words that? you know, you were able to use in your external communications 15, 20 years ago, you just throw your hands up like oh, that. I can't use that word anymore. It's lost its meaning in the general conversation. I I've got to think of something else now. Yeah, yeah, of course. No, that's, it's not a aha moment. It's a continual mm -hmm. assessment and measurement of the stock value of words as they are used, come in and out of use, as their definitions shift as cultural, social, um, religious, political mores shift, uh, you can't just declare that no one wants to learn or how come they don't, uh, they don't, they don't do their homework. That then you're not being an educator. You're being, sorry, you're not being a communicator. You, yeah. You can, you know, you are, you're being the professor talking to the chalkboard while you write down your equations. And, without any concern whether people are either paying attention or meeting you 90% of the way there. You can't claim yourself to be an educator, a, a, a communicator, unless you turn around, face the audience, and meet them 90% of the way towards wherever their brain wiring is. And so, so yeah, all this is, happens all the time. I also find that humor enables people to smile while they're learning, and then they come back for more. But the landscape of humor has changed, as you surely know, over the years, especially over the recent decades. Certain things that were funny in 2000 are not funny today because of sensitivities have been realigned or uh, arisen. Or maybe the sensitivities were always there, but there was no platform to, to, um, to position them. So, yes, yeah, plenty of words. Happens all the time. Uh, all right, so let's step back a little bit, and we we talk about or, or oh, oh one of, other thing. I, I, here's oh, yeah. a good example. Here's Go a ahead. good example. Um, I wrote about this in the late '90s, so this is 25 years in the uh, in the can right now. Uh, of course, in science, in a measurement, we speak of measurement errors, mm. and so the public wants to know what is the answer, and they don't really have much much way to embrace measurement errors it doesn't really work uh, unless we retrain everyone in school That's i don't think point. box and whisker plots uh test very well do they exactly exactly <laughs> so so what happens is um i saw a news account of a research paper that described the result and it said, oh, but it's not being, uh, um, it didn't catch on because the paper had a lot of errors in it. And I said, what? What does that even mean? And then I realized the paper talked about the measurement errors. And the journalists thought that this meant it had errors. And so I, I've never used the word error unless it's a literal error. So I changed error to uncertainty. I wrote an essay called Certain Uncertainties, <laughs> where I talked about when you measure something, there's uncertainties around those measurements. And I don't even use the word margin of error, which is still used when they report political voting results. Mar that's a start. Margin of error, plus or minus 3%. That came in in the last 20 years. That's very good. That's a start. But error is the wrong word because they are not errors even though we use that term uncertainty still works that still has scientific validity and you don't have to define it for the public they know what an uncertainty is and you can say some measured quantities are more uncertain than others that is a completely understandable sentence all right before i cut you loose i do have a couple more tangible science questions. Oh, sorry i've been doing i haven't given you a chance to ask no, this is two questions so far. This is just extraordinary. And I'm happy. I'm uh -huh. happy to have you here and talk about these things. So I'm, I was reading the book and which book? 
the most recent one um to infinity and beyond yes yes just came out two uh, months ago yes. so speed of light of course uh the we know the speed of light and it takes eight minutes for sunlight to get to earth about that yeah mm -hmm. right one of the things that i i have trouble thinking about and this is one of these cosmic query type things the sun instantly goes away we wouldn't uh -huh. know about it for eight minutes. That's correct. We'd still orbit. We'd still feel sunlight. We'd still feel gravity. That's that's we're... exactly what I wanted to, to ask. Do we? Does the gravitational information also take eight minutes? Does the Earth still act as if it is going in orbit around the sun? Or is that gravitational force instantly gone? Yeah, so there's a, um, there's a slight subtle difference here. In Einsteinian description of gravity, gravity is the curvature of space-time, okay? So we are orbiting in this curved space-time continuum caused by the sun. And the dimples in a rubber sheet get you most of the way to understand that, where we are sort of um, spiraling, uh, orbiting in the dimple. Okay, so if you instantly take away the sun that is a change in the gravitational field and changes in the gravitational field move at the speed of light so it would take eight minutes for you to even know that the sun wasn't that the sun's gravitational field was no longer operating on earth and we would instantly fly off at a tangent if that were the case, it's not, it's, I mean, after the eight minutes, eight minutes and 20 seconds, if you want to be precise. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. So yeah. So gravity uh, and Einstein demonstrated that gravity would move at the same as the speed of light. All right. Excellent. Last thing for, for, I, I let you go talk a little bit about this, this speaking tour. I, I've seen it advertised by different <laughs> at different theaters, slightly different ways. Is it going to be very different at each place or is this kind of all tying back to, to infinity and beyond or, what, what can people kind of expect? So thanks for noticing that. So uh, my speaking tour is hardly ever bordering on never related to books that I've just published. The speaking tour is I get invited by a city and many cities across the country, fascinatingly, have this sort of old grand dam theater from 100 years ago that they've with if there's municipal funds typically there are or business interests they fix it up and re what do you call it uh, renovate and they fix up the molding and the statues and the and the gilding and so it's, it's beautiful spaces and these are back when going to a theater you would dress up to go to see movies in the movie theater so many of them come from that era so many towns have such theaters and they remain in active use i get invited to a city to present and so i'm i'm honored and flattered i give them a list of 12 to 15 possible topics that they choose from and then they tell me we want you to come talk on this subject and that's what i do so for richmond they picked the topic that i've given them cosmic collisions oh my gosh cosmic collisions things that go bump in the night uh there's so many things that collide stars collide galaxies collide black holes collide um uh, asteroids collide with earth uh you know they we collided with an asteroid recently to try to deflect it so it's everything that's going on in the universe you know this idea that oh we live in a static beautiful let's say if you no no the universe is a shooting gallery and so i'm there to talk about how much of a shooting gallery it is. And yes, there, I have some videos and slides uh, and it's mostly me talking, um, but that's what Richmond is getting. There are other topics. I think I've been in this venue before. Um, other topics that, that either they didn't choose because I, I was there a couple of years ago or not would be the search for life in the universe. And that's continually being updated with the congressional hearings on aliens and all of this, that's a whole topic, search for life in the universe. Um, one of my favorites is, is an astrophysicist goes to the movies. <laughs> and that's where I, I highlight all manner of scenes, not just from sci-fi films, but other films you would never imagine cared about science, yet there's science in it. 
either done very well or done very badly. And I highlight that. And that was so popular. Um, there's a sequel to it called a An Astrophysicist Goes to the Movies, the sequel. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyhow, that, that's just a smattering of the topics. And typically, you know, there's a there's a book that I'd written recently. And if the theater is interested, they might task a, a local um, indie publisher to sell them in the lobby. But most of the time, that's not what happens. And if they do, it has nothing to do with the talk. Wonderful. So so in other words, when I go on, quote, tour, I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm a <laughs> servant of your of your appetite, of your cosmic appetite, as declared by the host for whatever it's their judgment of the audience's interest. Excellent. Well, I've got the book. It's wonderful. And personally, thank you for, as a meteorologist, thank you for starting with the atmosphere in the book. Oh, we did. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for noticing that we started. That's, oh, I yeah. noticed that right away. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 there's a whole discussion of the atmosphere because mm -hmm. the book To Infinity and Beyond, by the way, it's a beautiful book. I would say that even if I was not co-author of it, uh, I co-wrote it with our longtime uh, senior producer for Star Talk my my podcast this is a collaboration between star talk and nat national geographic books and so the book is they don't know how to make an ugly book uh this is national <laughs> geographic so it's highly illustrated um and it's an exploration of what it was like standing flat-footed on earth looking up and what did it take for us to ascend from earth to the stars and beyond you know we go from icarus that's a nice first story to tell and at icarus dies and you say to yourself well oh i'm not going to try to fly or you're going to say well let me maybe design the wings differently of a different material rather than wax okay and of course they thought that temperature would get higher as you ascended the atmosphere when of course the exact opposite is the case uh and so it's fun to explore what was imagined to be sort of infinitely far away in the history of this quest, we would then conquer it. Uh, let me use a less militaristic word. <laughs> we would then achieve those goals. And then we, we're standing in a new place now. We're now in balloons and we can say, well, how do we fly with not a balloon? Now we have airplanes and how do we fly out of the atmosphere? We have rockets. How do we fly beyond? The, how would we fly to the moon? How do we fly beyond the moon? Well, we can't do that yet, but we can send our robotic emissaries. How do we go beyond those? Well, then our mind takes us there. All right. And so part of this quest, the whole book chronicles and storytells the this quest, which is quite a it's the noblest thing. I mean, our species did it, and no one other species comes close to even wondering that this could be something we could do. So I, I'm I gotta hand it to humans for <laughs> to, <laughs> to making this work in that way so yeah that book only just came out two months ago and uh very proud of it and it's a very beautiful oh and the dna of my podcast star talk is science pop culture and humor i mentioned humor earlier the pop culture part is you show up at the door with a pop culture scaffold that i already know because that's the definition of pop culture it's a common knowledge i don't have to say who beyonce is or what a football field looks like there's certain fundamentals that are out there we take the science and clad it onto that scaffold so that you already care about something and now you care about it more because i've get added more information for you to celebrate about the thing this pop culture thing you cared about point is in this book we do that continually if there's a hollywood movie that touches some of the topics that we address I dip in, this is like the scenery along the way of the book. I dip into the movie and we talk about what, how well the movie did or didn't uh, portray that physics. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Tyson, uh, I know you've got to get, get going. So yep. thank you so much for your time. Uh, shout out to Chuck Nice and all the team there at Star Talk. Love the work. Love what he brings to it as well. And when you have the guests, my, my comedian, my my co-host comedian, yes. or foil, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's wonderful. Thank you so much. Looking forward to seeing you uh, when you're down here in, in Richmond next week uh, and travel safe, sir. Excellent. Thank you for those well wishes. All Take right. care. Bye-bye.